I'd like to first um, thank Andrew for that gracious introduction. Um, thankfully, he did not go through every single achievement or accolade, um, some of which I care not to remember. But uh, before we go further, I'd like to uh, correct um, one of the things that he mentioned and elaborate a little further on it because it's part of the presentation this morning. In 1981, when I arrived in New Jersey, having had a bachelor's in sales and marketing, and my wife had transferred from Bell Atlantic in Ohio, where we lived for 11 years. I, why we lived for 11 years? Well, when I graduated, there was hardly anyone in Bowling Green uh, to take care of the needs of the students. And as a student, knowing the importance of having an adult to take care of your needs, I volunteered. And I stayed eight years and worked in a factory so that I could have the time to devote to student needs. And oh, I got students everything they wanted. If they thought they had a great issue, I just went straight to the top and got the necessary adjustment or got them to take the course over again without any charge or pay. Or if they got into an altercation with the police, I was right there and resolved it. And that. So I became the go-to guy even at that point. And no, I wasn't called the Don then. Um, <laughs> there was another name that was like, more like the Godfather. Um, and and it, it sort of rippled into the workplace also, <laughs> became the go-to guy. Uh, and when we moved in 1981 to New Jersey, it was just because my wife's family lived in East Orange and we were just she was tired. I, I was okay with it. Driving for Christmas, for birthdays and anniversaries, just back and forth. Up that turnpike through, you know, Pittsburgh and the wake and any and every type of weather. Finally she said, We gotta go. Family is important, you gotta be close to family and this up and trekking through the snowstorm and the ice and you know, it's not, it's not going to work. I said, okay. Gentlemen, there is time to fight your battles, and then there's time to submit. <laughs> so it was a minor battle, and it was a terrible departure uh, from the vocation that I had volunteered and took up in Bowling Green. In fact, it was such a departure that my wife said, I will leave you and go with my brothers in this truck and you can stay one month and do all of your departure stuff. It, it took a month between the black churches and the surrounding communities of Bowling Green who assisted me a great deal in resolving many issues between these students and administrators and teachers. And after that month, I arrived, resided in East Orange, and had to find a job. Could not find a job. I mean, a guy with a sales and marketing degree, having worked in a factory for eight, you know, eight, nine years, on the East Coast in New Jersey, looking for a position in sales and marketing, are you crazy? Wasn't happening. So, I persisted, and every day I went out, filled out applications. Every day I went out, I spoke to people. My uncle-in-law, Wendell Wilson, uh, became very helpful as a Newark housing manager in terms of introducing me to a network, a platform of people that he had, in hopes that they would find a way to get me a job. Well, between hitting the bars and all the holes in the wall in Newark and the receptions and the meetings and the lunches, finally, Wendell Wilson said, 
after three months. And after my wife saying, did you have a job yet? Did, when are you going to have a job? And he said, you know what, I think we need to look at the classified section of the Star Legend and see what sales <laughs> positions you can find. Next day I had a sales position, East Rutherford, working for Futurecraft, selling waterless cookware, stemware, and also flatware, and china, out of a little suitcase my first New Jersey job. And I thought it was wonderful. Flexible time, assigned to Bergen County, had no clue what Bergen County was. <laughs> Found it with our GPS in those days. Got pulled over. What are you doing in this neighborhood? Said the police. I said, well, here's my ID and this is what I do. And he's like, I don't think they do any solicitation here. I said, I think they do, I checked it out. And it was true, I checked it out. Always do your homework. Always do your homework, because you never know. And so I was released, continued, no sales. Until finally, like the end of the first week, this old lady opened up her door kept the latch on, <laughs> peeked through it, and said, can I help you? And I said, sure. I, and I began to describe what I have in my suitcase. And she said, you know, son, I, 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 don't, I, I can't afford any of this. I, don't, I really don't have any money, for any, and I don't need any of this. But, but come on in. And she just unlatched that door and walked away. And she turned back and said, come, come in. And I said, wow. After having doors slammed in your face, after being told rudely no, here is a person divinely sent to me that says, come on in, but also says, there will be no sales here. So why am I going in? <laughs> Instinctively, when these things happen, you must follow. There is something at the end of the rainbow that you don't know, that you're supposed to know. That's a dot. So I went in. She said, please sit. And then she disappeared into her bedroom, came back holding something, and sat down across from me and said, son, open that suitcase and let me see a few things. And I didn't recognize what she had in her hand. And I was so excited to open my little suitcase and do my little demonstration, you know, because I hadn't done any. <laughs> and I picked up the china. And I held it like I was trained. And this lady said, she shook her head and she said, put that down, son. And I put it down and she said, this is why I went into the bedroom, because I thought you were going to do that. Here, this is yours, and you can keep it. And every time you hold that china, you have to use this, because china is fine. She gave me a pair of white gloves. She also said that I suggest to you in this neighborhood, before you knock on the next door, <laughs> put those white gloves on. I said, why? She said, they'll ask you a lot of questions and you'll get inside. <laughs> <laughs> Within a month, I was about salesperson number three. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Within about four months, I was on my way to Bahamas because in this, you know, uh, future craft, um, marketing scheme that they had. If you had X sales and you qualify and they put you on a plane because they want to send you because they want to bring. And then my check bounced. And Wendell Wilson said, when you work for a company and the check bounces, there's a problem. So I suggest you look for some other employment. So we started making the rounds again, you know, all the bars and all the holes in the wall and 
he said, you know what? After about a month, <laughs> I have someone I need to introduce you to. I think you're going to find another source of revenue. And so he introduced me to Shalia Hill. Names are important. Because if names become bridges in your life, you must always give them credit. You must never forget them. Because without them, you could not be where you are. Shalia Hill, Miss Newark Housing at one point, said, I'd like to see what you have in your suitcase. Your uncle said that you, and I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Another sale. But she said, more importantly, I have an opportunity for you. Because your uncle said that your check bounces. Therefore, I am doing sales also. And I'd like you to join me in selling because that's another revenue stream. After signing Shalia up for some china and some waterless cookware, I said, what are you selling that you want me to help you with? She said, lingerie. <laughs> I said, well, you know, once a salesman, always a salesman, I, I can sell lingerie. I, I just need a tutorial. And I received the tutorial. And then I used my network that I established and got lingerie parties going. A and I didn't have to be there most of the time. And those times I was there, I made sure we made more sales. And so Shalia Hill said, I don't think you need to do this. You know, if your check bounces at Futurecraft, and you're selling lingerie and you're doing good, maybe you need to work at the cable company. That's how I landed in 1981. In a, on a September at the cable company because Shalia Hill also worked at the cable company. She worked in the programming department. And she thought I should be in sales. And so I went there as a willing and able person to be in sales. Never had cable, never saw cable, just knew how to spell cable. That's it. I went in. I told the lady who was in the marketing department on the first floor at 360 Central Avenue, used to be the Cadillac dealership building back in the days in Newark. I said, I'm here to fill out an application. But Shalia Hill is right. She says, yeah, I know Shalia Hill. She told me you were coming. But you know, um, Mr. Calvin Reed, he's not here to interview you. And uh, neither is Al Bundy. So you'll have to come back tomorrow. And I was like, with my suitcase. And, and with my lingerie catalog. I was I will wait. <laughs> well, that could, I will wait. And I sat down. Opened up that little suitcase, polishing my china, you know, and all the young ladies who were working in customer service going to the back, they were like, what's in your suitcase? I said, well, it's a little high end, but here is also the catalog for the lawn. You can take it back to you. You can circle. I'll be right here. <laughs> well, Mr. Reed and Mr. Bundy didn't show up, and I went home with a few orders and a few sales, and <laughs> next day, back again. <laughs> I mean, I had to fulfill some orders, and I had to wait for Mr. Bundy and Mr. Reed. Well, in some of those days, Mr. Bundy and Mr. Reed, they were busy in meetings, and they were like, well, maybe I'll see you this afternoon. Come back. I did not leave. After a few days, people thought I was actually working in the building. <laughs> it took about a month or more for me to get an interview. A month or more. But I was there every day. And when I got that interview, I think it was by chance, <laughs> because Mr. Bundy came up to me while someone was, you know, engaging in a sale. 
that I'm not sure they were supposed to do at that time because maybe they were supposed to be on the clock. And Mr. Bunny said, well, what are you doing, Don? I said, oh, you know my name? He says, yeah, everybody here knows your name. <laughs> I says, uh, and, and, and you are? And he says, Mr. Bunny, oh, Mr. Bunny, I've been waiting to. He says, yeah, and I've been busy, and I see you're busy. What, what do you have in your suitcase? <laughs> Mr. Bundy bought something <laughs> and told me, don't come back. We're not hiring right now. We have your name, and, your inf and if we are hiring, we will call you. Do not come back in the building. You know when you get hit by a Mack truck, but you didn't really see the Mack truck? <laughs> you just feel the hit of the Mack truck? That's how I felt. That was how I felt when I met Mr. Bundy and he bought <laughs> something out of the suitcase. But that's how it ended. I left that building 360 Central Avenue. I remember vividly walking to my car thinking, maybe Shalia Hill was wrong. Maybe this was not supposed to be. Maybe I should have been pursuing, as my wife thought, further applications in other businesses. Instead, I spent over a month selling waterless cookware china, selling lingerie, at 360 Central Avenue, Connection Communications Corporations. I got in my car, started the engine, and remembered something. When something comes to your mind, it comes to your mind for a reason. It's another dot. Pursue it. Make a note of it. Follow up on it. Entering into my mind was this Reminder of my wife saying, don't forget to pay your car insurance because without your car, you can't make any sales. And so I went up the street in Central Avenue to pay my car insurance. I stopped in East Orange at Owen Morris, another name I'll never forget. And I sat there in Owen's office to pay my car insurance. Owen Morris was a friend of the family handled all the insurance for all my wife's aunts and uncles and so forth. And so that's why I had my car insurance. Owen knew me because he'd been over to some birthday parties and anniversaries. And when it was my time to go up and pay Owen Morris for my car insurance, he looked at me and he said, you look awful. What happened? Well, I didn't tell him I get hit by a Mack truck. <laughs> but I said, I was down the street and trying to find a job, and they told me, you know, um, don't come back until they call me. And he says, you haven't found a job yet? I says, no, but I'm, I'm looking. He said, well, who just told you not to come back? And I says, Connection Communications Corporation. He said, the cable company? I says, yes. He says, who? And the minute he said, who? My heart lifted. It's like, oh, he knows somebody down there? Mm -hmm. I said, this guy, Al Bundy, who's a supervisor, he's like, Al Bundy, hold on. Did, you went, how, tell me what happened. And I told him the story. You know, I've been down there a month, and I've been waiting. And, and while I'm finishing the story, he's already picked up the phone, and he's dialing some numbers. And he started on the phone, and he says, hello. Let, no, no, let me talk to Barry. My name is Owen Morris. I need to talk to Barry now. Yeah, I'm there quivering because the tone of his voice and he's getting ready to say and intervene something and I'm not sure this is the right way because, you know, I, I don't know. Well, Barry must have gotten on the other line and Owen says, you have to hire this guy. And this and he starts pumping me up, and I, I, felt like, oh, I, I felt like I was lifted off the chair. Well, he was just blowing my reputation up. And I was like, oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time he hung up, he says, you have a job. I said, who's Barry? He says, Barry's the owner. 
I said, you know the owner? <laughs> he says, yeah, he's a nice guy. He's a tall guy, you know. He's a little clumsy looking, but he's, he's a nice guy. So listen, when you start tomorrow, don't forget. Don't mess my reputation up. I used a lot of capital to get you in the door. When you get in, help as many other people as you can to get in. But don't mess my reputation up. Do everything right and do it by the book. So I went down there. The rest is not yet history. There were more obstacles. I get down there the next day. In the sales department, no one wants to really greet me. Later that week, I find out it's because, you know, I came through the back door through Mr. Barry Washington. I didn't like, you know, do what you're supposed to do. And of course, my training is 30 minutes. I got one of those instant training programs. <laughs> you know, like when they really don't want to train you? Or they want to train you to fail? Max Rodriguez trained me. He said, like, oh, I don't have any time, so just listen carefully. Bam, bam, we're done. L let's go out. I'm just going to be with you one hour, and then we'll, you go your way, and I go. Well, sales, zero. Next day, zero. <laughs> Next morning, I get in. Early in the morning, you know, that little voice again says, you're not doing good. You need to get in soon. And because you need to get in soon, you need to find out somebody who can help you because you don't know what you're doing. I got in 8 o'clock. Now, sales, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. What am I doing there at 8 o'clock when no one is there? I, I didn't know. But as I sat trying to do my tea, because I, I didn't drink coffee from those days, and I'm going through my little paperwork <laughs> for what I don't know. I don't have any sales. <laughs> and walks this guy that I had never seen before. Looked like he was 57, 55, gray hair, African American, this little bald, and ch chain smoking. Those days you were allowed to smoke in the office. And he sat down and he started doing his paperwork. And I'd never seen him, so I wondered, like, who is this guy? And I said, Sir, my name is Don. Don Viper, and he looked up at the board and he saw the zeros. He says, oh, you're the new guy. I've heard about you. And I said, well, how could he have heard about me? And he hasn't been here. And I asked him. And he says, oh, a lot of people are talking about you because, you know, you, you came through the back door. And um, you're not doing so good. He looked at the board again. I said, yes, and what is your name? He said, Bruce Christopher. And I looked at the board. Bruce is number one. Average eight to 12 sales a day. <laughs> Nothing compared to my zero. <laughs> so I said to Bruce, Bruce, can you help me, please? Can you show me the way and give me a little? Bruce said, I'd love to, but not today. Oh, I just got hit by a car. <laughs> not a Mack truck, because Bruce was endearing. He's like, tomorrow. And I said, you sure not today? He's like, today I have some personal business. That's why I'm handing in my stuff. I, I, I got to go. And so Bruce, the next day, taught me on the streets of Newark just to be myself. Forget about that training stuff. Just when someone opens the door, connect. Show your humanness to that person. If they have a baby in their hand, make comments about the baby that you genuinely believe. If it's a lady and she looks like she's tired or whatever, say a kind word with a smile. And when you get in, get down on your knees, at least one knee, as you demonstrate and illustrate what's in that book. I said, why the knee? He says, that's called the begging position. And you don't get up until you get the sale. I says, oh. And it worked. I became number two. 
I said one day to Bruce, Bruce, can I ever be number one? And why not? He says, I didn't teach you everything, son. <laughs> he says, but when I leave, I'm sure you'll be number one. A and I was. And some days I gave him a run for it. Because I knew what days. He lived in the Bronx, by the way. Came to Newark every day for his job. Every day. So that's how I got into the industry. And then I moved up all the way to the point when I retired in 2015 as Director of Public and Government Affairs, which took me throughout the state because then Connection Cable sold to Gateway Cable in 1987 for $34 million. I was then their sales manager, yes, and marketing manager. And so they invited me to be on the transition team. I, I didn't know what a transition team meant. I, I was just, you know, from sales, through sales supervisor, I'm just in charge of guys, and a transition team sounded to me like a very important thing. So I'm in New York across some table with some lawyers arguing and throwing things at each other, using some four-letter with colorful words, overpriced, and I'm just sitting against the wall waiting for a signal to go back to Newark to get more paperwork, and I, I, I don't know what this is, but it's important. And after the sale, the new company, Gateway Cable, kept me. Asked me to stay and do the same thing. Raised me up to director of sales and marketing and started to pick my brain and ask me all the time, you know, well, where is this? Is there a manual? And I said, the manual's right here. And that's how you become valuable. If the manual is right here, you're always going to have value and credibility. And so literally, because it was an absentee ownership, I, without the title, became like the assistant GM. The only thing I didn't do was sign checks. And then they sold, because they had to. The owner died of lumbar cancer. Daughter didn't want it. So Ruth Gilbert asked me to be on her transition team. Well, now I think I'm an expert, because you know, you've been on one, you've seen how it rolls, and here I am in New York again, and watching lawyers argue and using colorful words, and it sold for 78 million to Cablevision. In 1991, 92. And then Cablevision said, Where's the manual? And I said, It's right here. And they said, We'll keep you. And then they made me assistant general manager. And then the system moved from having three municipalities to when I left, I was in charge of 80 municipalities or so. All the way from Monmouth and County to Sussex County. So my car was putting on a lot of miles, and in the meantime, I received, thank goodness, a lot of contacts. And a lot of contacts means a lot of dots. In your life, you meet people every single day. You don't know if the people that you meet will become a bridge or a disaster. But you have to listen to yourself and listen to your heart because they're in front of you for a purpose. And that's what a dot connector is. You must try and become the best dot connector that you can become because every dot matters. It may not matter for your business, but it may matter for your life. It may not matter for your life, but it may matter for someone else's life who you are in touch with. And so you must never abdicate any dot that comes in front of you. Every experience is a valuable experience. And it's happening to you for a purpose. You know, we have a world of 7.2 billion people soon to be 9.4. And in this world of so many people, there are so many possibilities. 
so many opportunities. Are there difficulties? Yes, there are difficulties. But in every difficulty lies a creative challenge. And if you understand and believe in yourself, and that's why you're here, then you know there is absolutely nothing that you can't do. It's just that you need some more dots. And you need to be the dot connector. In closing, I want to let you know that this place that we're in, the Newer Club, I was here for its grand opening. And then, as it says, the end of an era on your program, when a Andrew asked me, you know, I'm trying to do a power breakfast conceptually before this even got started, and I'm looking for a place. I said, why don't you come with me? I have a dot. And I introduced him to the guys that manage this place. And I told them, because, you know, sometimes you can't, I told them, make sure you give Andrew the Don Viapri price. Mm -hmm. I don't treat Andrew like anybody else. And that's how the power breakfast started at the Newark Club. And so when he asked me while I was in Guatemala two months ago, can you speak in February? I said, well, I'm not, w w what date? I'm not sure I'll be back. And he said, well, no, you called the date. And then he told me that the Newark Club was closing. And I said, well, how, how can I not want to do this? And that's how things work. I was with him at the beginning at the Newark Club, and now we're closing at the end. And so thank you for that invitation to speak today and I'd like to also show you that in using your dots along the way, don't just keep them to yourself. They're not yours. They're never going to be yours. They're only in your sphere of presence because you're passing through. Share them and share as much as you can with everyone else, whether they accept it or not. Just share them. And you will find that by sharing them, you will receive more dots. There are people who come up to me now and say, and I said, excuse me, I'm a little old now. I can't recall where I met you or what your name is. Could you please help me? Because that's what happens when you have tens of thousands of experiences across the world. Also remember that dots are like on a platform. So if you're in business and you're thinking of the people that you deal with in business, you must take it a little further and think of the people outside of your business that you're not dealing with, that you have no reason to deal with. And that is even more important because the ones you don't have to deal with are probably going to turn out to be the ones that you should be dealing with them. Why? Because they have a wealth of information that relates directly back to what you're trying to do in your business. But you did not know that because you perceived and presumed that because they're out of your business that they're not as important to you. And so you sort of let them go for a long, long time. The moral of the story is that every single human being, no matter where they are, who they are, what they do, they are important to you. 
Every single one of us is important to each other because every single one of us is connected to each other. There is nothing on this planet or in this galaxy that is unconnected to something else. Everything in this galaxy is connected to everything in this galaxy. And so we must leave this concept that we were trained and taught that we need to sort of keep into this little cubicle or this little cubbyhole of our associations and businesses. And we must venture out because in venturing out we can keep the neurons in our brain bright and we can learn so many new things and we can meet so many new people and light bulbs will begin to go off and the dots will begin to become connected and you will then become a better person and a more successful person. And you will be able to help hundreds of people more. And that is the gift of life. And so, in closing, remember that your life is all about your business. Because your business is your life. Remember that both of them demand your attention. And in demanding your attention, whether you have defined goals or not, you can meet those goals and objectives because you know how to connect the dots. And because you value human beings, and because you value yourself, and within yourself you know that you have a certain power, a certain divine power. And that has enabled you to get to this point this far. This power that's within you is also a power that exists in the universe. You must positively tap into this power, tap into yourself. And you must proactively direct it in a protracted and organized manner so that you can achieve your goals. Because by achieving your goals and connecting the dots, you're thereby coming back and empowering your life, your business, for your success and your happiness. And don't forget, share it. Thank you very much.